I want to begin by uh, 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 just going over where we'd got to last time before looking at questions about whether Fodor's approach can possibly be right. Um, so the general approach here is what we're trying to do is explain how it is that we have reference, that we have truth and falsity in the language at all. And we're trying to do that by talking about the causal connections that things stand in to the signs of the language. That's a general project. So it's explaining reference in terms of causation. And then the disjunction problem is um, if you have X's and Y's both causing the sign X to be produced, but X's are what the sign refers to, and Y's are mere lookalikes, then how can, how, with what right can we say that the causal connection between X's and the sign X is the one that fixes reference, and the causal connection between Y's and the sign X is just something that's producing illusions? Why is one rather than the other uh, the causal connection that's fixing reference? That's the disjunction problem. So we have these two causal pathways. Horses cause, I mean, let's just stick with Fodor's toy example. As came up last time in the discussion, um, this is really a simplification. Lots of language is much more um, complexly interwoven, and you don't uh, always get nice, discrete packages like this. But let's just work with this for the moment. Suppose we have this nice, discrete package. Horses cause production of the word horse. Cows cause production of the word horse. But only one of these is the reference fixing relation. Why is that? Why does one rather than the other? What makes that relation hold? Well, um, the answer is um, this causal connection, the causal connection here, if this causal connection between horses and cows went away, if that had not existed, would there be that causal connection between cows and the use of the word horse? No, that's the right answer. Look, there you go. <laughs> right. Okay, so if this relation went away, this one would go away. Okay? But now, suppose, class, that the causal connection between cows and the word horse went away. Would the causal connection between horses and the word horse go away? No, look, it just stays there, <laughs> right? So that's a difference between the two causal connections. So the, the, the one on the left um, does not depend on the one on the right. If the one on the right went away, the one on the left would still be there. But, if the, uh, but the one on the right does depend on the one on the left. If the one on the left went away, the one on the right um, would go away too. Yes? That's asymmetric dependence. Um, so the causal connection between cows and the word horse is asymmetrically dependent on the causal connection between horses and the word horse. So is that terminology, at this point, you're very comfortable with that? Dependent, this one's, the one on the right is dependent on this one in the sense that if that one went away, that one would go away too. But it's asymmetric in that it doesn't go around the other way. Okay. Um, so the analysis is, if you've got that asymmetric dependence, the dependent causation is causation of mistakes. The independent causation is what's fixing the reference. And just let's do that exercise. If D stood for being a horse or a cow, then you'd have... Um, a situation in which horses cause D and cows cause D, but uh, these two causal connections would be dependent on one another. If one went away, they'd both go away. And that works either way around. Yeah? Yep. That's right, yeah. That, that's exactly it. That's a, that's a good example. Yeah. 
Uh huh. Uh, that's right. Well, there are two things here. One, one is the contrast between a genuine umbrella term like mammal that isn't defined as either a horse or a cow or something, yeah, um, and one that really is just defined as either or. Right? That's a good distinction. But I think um, D here could be a term of either sort. Yeah. If cows just went away, um, uh, then... The <laughs> How should I say, there wouldn't be any cows around to cause the use of the term, that's right. But it would still be true that the causal connection between cows, were there any, and the use of the term would be in place. You wouldn't have disconnected the connection, you'd just have uh, taken away the stuff in one end of it, if I can put it like that. Yeah. Um. Okay, so if you've got that symmetric dependence, then... Uh, uh, both of the causal connections matter for the meaning of the term. Yeah, th th that's the idea. So if it's symmetric dependence, then both of the uh, causal connections matter for the meaning of the term. Um, but if you've got uh, ambiguity, so suppose there's a, a set, <laughs> I mean, if Fodor pointed to a, um, a horse, a, a cow, and said horse, and said, of course, I was using the word horse there in the sense of cow, um, then uh, you could say, well, the word horse in that understanding of it is systematically ambiguous, right? There's two just quite different meanings. In one sense, it means horse. In another sense, it means cow. Then you get two causal connections from horses to the use of the word horse and from cows to the use of the word horse. Um, but they don't matter for each other. If you took one away, the other one would still be there. And that works both ways around. So if you've got um, an independence that's symmetric, then you just get an ambiguous term. Right? So the, um, if you've got dependence, then that tells you that uh, there's only one sense of the word here. It's not ambiguous. And if it's asymmetric, that tells you that one of the, these connections is the one that's fixing reference, and the other one isn't. Yeah, if that's all plain as day, then you've really got it. Got the theory, okay. Um, so depe asymmetrically dependent causation is causation of mistakes. So just one last thing here. We'd explain, I, I just did that by making the arrows go away, but just to be fully explicit, what we're saying is if how horse, if this is counterfactual, this is about what's going on in, in other possible worlds. If horses didn't cause horse to be produced, then cows would not cause horse to be produced. Even if cows didn't cause horse to be produced, horses would still cause horse to be produced. Um, uh, it's these points about what's going on in other possible worlds that are telling you which causal connection fixes reference and which one doesn't. Okay. Are you absolutely at ease with that? Oh, sorry. Um, excuse me. Okay. The thing is, here we have a really serious attempt to give an explanation of how it comes about that there are standards of right and wrong for language. It's saying there are standards of right and wrong for sentences in virtue of, and then what's coming after that is something from the natural sciences something that doesn't presuppose talk about meaning at all. Yeah? Um, and when we're talking about these causal connections and this asymmetric dependence, the attempt is to get something that's very austere, from which talk about meaning has been um, eliminated. So you can understand this base independently of knowing anything about meaning. A Martian that didn't know anything about human languages should be able to come to Earth and spot that asymmetric dependence in the causal connections and say, aha, so they use the term horse to refer to horses, but sometimes they get taken in by cows. If you didn't know anything about meaning, you should be able to derive the facts about meaning from these um, more basic points about asymmetric dependences. 
the trouble is, and this, the, uh, it took me a little while to see this, but many of the questions last time are actually homing in, I think. I mean, <laughs> that's my picture of it. But many of the questions last time are actually homing in in the comment I want to make now. Here's how Fodor explains the asymmetric dependence. And it's actually very like the way I was explaining it last time. Misidentifying a cow as a horse wouldn't have led me to say horse, except that there was independently a semantic relation between horse tokens and horses. So that the key point is that meaning relation, that reference relation, the semantic relation is there. But for the fact that the word horse expresses the property of being a horse, but for the fact that there's that semantic um, uh, fact about horse, it would not have been that word that taking a cow to be a horse would have caused me to utter. So it's very clear when he's explaining this that this actually appeals to facts about semantics. When you're explaining what the asymmetric dependence is, you actually are talking about something that has to do with semantic relations. Um, his point is, the semantic relation between horse and horses holds independently of the cow's horse relation. Well, that's okay, but th I mean, that's true, but that's the fact we were trying to explain. We are trying to characterize what that means, that there's a semantic relation. We are trying to explain in naturalistic terms how there can be such a thing. The thing is, it seems like, I think that's a, that's a real giveaway, this paragraph. Because it seems like what's going on is, and as I say, if you, re, if you recall some of the discussion last time, that people were really pressing on this point. What's happening here is that given the meaning of the word horse, since the word horse has the meaning it does, it's a consequence of that, that if horses didn't cause the word horse to be produced, Cows would not cause the word horse to be produced because cows are coming in only as lookalikes exploiting our understanding of horse. So it's the facts about meaning that explain the existence of these causal relations. In fact, you can only say what the causal connection is here by appealing to these points about meaning. If we're really going to be getting a deep explanation here, it should be that the facts about causation are explaining the existence of the facts about meaning. But this is round the other way. The facts about meaning explain the existence of the asymmetric dependence. And given the meaning of the word horse, if cows didn't cause horse to be produced, horses would still cause horse to be produced. That's to say, the way you now understand the word horse, you could keep that intact, even if you weren't being fooled, even if you'd improved your discrimination capacities. So what that means is, again, that it's the facts about meaning that explain the existence of the asymmetric dependence. So the asymmetric dependences, maybe they exist at any rate in these simplified models of language. But they don't themselves explain anything about meaning. They are consequences of the facts about meaning. Naturalism was trying to explain how there can be standards of right and wrong for sentences without appealing to notions like meaning. We were trying to explain how it comes about that in the world described by physics, um, there is such a thing as going right or wrong in your use of sentences. But all that's happening here is that we're saying, given that you're in a world where there are facts about how you go right or wrong on your use of sentences, as a consequence of that, there will be these causal relations. The idea is, if the word horse means horse and you know what's going on, that is, you know that uh, the word horse means horse, then these things, the horses, are going to cause production of your term horse. The causal connection here is a result of the fact about meaning. And anything you can't differentiate from a horse will also cause production of your term horse. This is all that's happening here. Um, you take the facts about meaning as basic, then you remark, given that someone knows these facts about meaning, given that someone understands the word, then there's going to be that causal connection between horses and their use of the word, and they're going to be taken in by lookalikes, 
but they can improve the discrimination against the look or of the lookalikes. Um, so you get the asymmetric dependence. Um, but that doesn't explain anything about how there comes to be such a thing as meaning in the first place. A slightly different way to put this point is to say, we are, after all, looking at counterfactuals here. If cows didn't uh, cause horse, if horses didn't cause horse, um, it's obviously not <laughs> naturalistically acceptable to say, and we held constant the meaning of the word horse. But with these questions about zebras and so on last time, what people were saying is, well, which other world are we talking about when we say, if cows didn't cause horse or if horses didn't cause horse? Are we talking about, for example, a world in which zebras didn't cause the meaning of the word horse, uh, didn't cause the use of the word horse? Um, and I said, well, it, what we've got here is in the nearest worlds in which horses don't cause the use of the word horse, cows don't cause the use of the word horse. But really, saying nearest is not much of a steer as to which world we're going to be looking at. What we really want to be able to say is um, these worlds we want, those worlds in which horses don't cause horse, um, in those worlds, um, cows don't cause horse. What we want is, these are worlds in which the word horse has lost its meaning. We also say in the nearest worlds in which cows don't cause horse, horses still cause horse. We want it to be that um, these are worlds in which the word horse has still kept its meaning. It's very hard to know how we could possibly specify exactly which nearby worlds we're talking about unless we're using the notion of meaning. We can't even say which counterfactuals matter here. I and mean, I kept saying when I was trying to um, make it intuitive uh, what the asymmetric dependence is, well, if horses didn't cause the use of the word horse anymore, that could only be because the word horse had lost its meaning. And then that drives your sense as to which worlds you're talking about. But you're having to use the notion of meaning to explain even what asymmetric dependence is. And if you couldn't use the notion of meaning here, it's not even obvious why you diagram the situation this way. Diagramming the situation this way starts out with two causal pathways and says, well, one of them matters for reference. But if you really said, let's forget about meaning for the moment. Let's just look at the hard facts. Let's just look at the basis for our talk about meaning. What would you have? You just have one causal pathway by which both horses and cows cause the use of the word horse. So the whole thing is round the wrong way. There's a causal asymmetry, all right, but it can't explain the facts about meaning. Rather, the facts about meaning explain the existence of the causal asymmetry. So this way of explaining how there can be meaning in a natural world is simply hopeless. Yep. How there can be meaning? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's fair enough. If, if you read it that way, if you say, um, I'm going to take for granted that there is such a thing as meaning, truth, reference, and so on. And I just want to point out, here's a kind of diagnostic you could use um, that would be helpful in thinking about. Suppose you're facing a foreign language to translate, and you're wondering, um, uh, are, these, um, uh, are these remarks by the natives, are they um, by the indigenous population, are they... Uh, uh, expressions of mistakes, or are they getting it right? Then you could appeal to causal asymmetry as a kind of diagnostic, yeah? taking for granted the facts about meaning. But that's really not the, pro that, that, the project here was supposed to be a lot more ambitious than that. I, 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 t you, you have to take my word for it, but if you look at the photo text, you'll see that right from the start, r r r right, GSI, is this correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd allow you to keep me honest. Uh, I, it seems to me right from the word go, the problem he's trying to address there is 
We live in a world that is entirely a physical world. How did this happen? Yeah, that we got language, that we got representation. And if you think about Dretschke, in Dretschke it's the same project. Um, given that all that's going on is um, a whole bunch of biology, where did the standards of right and wrong come from? Yeah, the, the idea is to get right down to brass tacks and explain the existence of right and wrong. But you're right. The, the, that's one reason this is an important idea. It's important partly because it's such, um, how should I say, a, a bald-headed attempt to go right at the problem. Yeah, and you forgive him all the simplifications if, if you can get the simple case right here. It would be so great to get the simple case right. It, yeah. Um, uh, but even if it's not right, it's likely to be a valuable idea anyhow, you know, a good piece to have in, in thinking about these problems, in just the kind of way you're suggesting. But that's a lot more limited than the exciting original idea. Yeah. Uh, okay? Okay. It seems to me, though, in fact, that this problem actually generalizes. It's partly because... Um, Fodor's account is so gung-ho, you know, he really is going for it. He really is trying to do the thing here of explaining meaning in terms that don't presuppose meaning. And when you see how, how difficult it is, you know, it actually starts to look like the problem here is quite general. I mean, suppose Fodor solved the problem. Suppose you could say, in entirely naturalistic terms, um, uh, what this asymmetric dependence is. Suppose you could do it without talking about meaning. Suppose you would just give him that the objection I just raised is no good, right? So then you could say how co cows cause horse depends on how horses cause, how cause horse. So you'd have then a kind of imitation, you'd have a kind of look-alike for, I mean, as the last commenter said, um, you've got this, in fact, when you have meaning, as a consequence of that, you have this asymmetric dependence. Um, so you, when you know you're dealing with facts about meaning, you can look for this asymmetric dependence to clue you in as to just how the facts about meaning lie, you know, wh which, which uh, utterances express mistakes and which are correct. Um, so you'd have a kind of facsimile of that. Um, if you stated causal asymmetry, in terms that don't require meaning, you'd have described something that looks quite like the situation you do find in languages that do have meaning. I suppose, for example, it turned out that there's a high temperature pathway. Suppose visu the visual system has got a low temperature pathway and a high temperature pathway. Right? There are no vision scientists here. <laughs> Take my word for it. Uh, one of them is very, very hot, and one of them is very, very cold. Um, 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 you don't really notice it because of the fantastic insulation in the brain. Um, so suppose what goes on is that there's a high temperature pathway by which horses cause the use of the word horse, and a low temperature pathway, um, cows cause the use of the word horse. I mean, the, uh, I have to say that you, you have to be suspending disbelief a bit here, because partly the, the point of the example is that Ringers, for anything, are actually using the same causal pathway. I mean, the whole thing about being able to be taken in by a ringer is that once you set up a vision so it can detect horses, you have thereby set it up so it can be taken in by a ringer. Do you see what I mean? Because vision is not infallible. So th this can't be quite right. You're not going to get two distinct pathways in that easy way. But let's suppose that that did happen. Um, suppose that the illusions all came in by the low temperature pathway and the real thing all came in by the high temperature pathway. And suppose it turned out that for um, reasons that are very technical and um, that I don't really have the, the, um, j the jargon to explain it to you properly, but suppose it turns out that when you look at the high temperature pathway in the brain and the low temperature pathway in the brain, uh, it turns out that they're asymmetrically dependent. I mean, let's suppose that um, um, the low temperature, the high temperature pathway is really what keeps everything running. And the low temperature pathway derives all its energy. It taps off 
um, the energy it needs to keep going from the high temperature pathway, right? Okay, so here we got the, um, just to, um, not to overwhelm you with technical detail, but here we've got the high temperature pathway, here we've got the low temperature pathway. The low temperature pathway is getting its energy from the high temperature pathway. So if the um, high temperature pathway got knocked out, would the low temperature pathway keep running? No. Um, but if the, high temp if, if the uh, 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 low temperature pathway got knocked out, would the high temperature pathway keep running? Yes. So do we have a dependence here of one pathway on the other? Yes? Is it an asymmetric dependence? Yes. OK, look at that. Um, so now we got, that, that's purely naturalistic. Right? I didn't talk about meaning at all there. I just talked about temperatures and one drawing energy off from the other. So then you've got a kind of facsimile, a kind of imitation of that asymmetric dependence, this kind of diagnostic of meaning and illusion in um, ordinary talk about thought and meaning. So you've got these two pathways, and the cow-horse pathway, the uh, low temperature pathway, is asymmetrically dependent on the horse-horse pathway. But what's happening here is that these simple engineering facts, I mean, well, actually, I shouldn't. They're very complex engineering facts. But um, they are, <laughs> if you don't mind me putting it like this, they are just engineering facts. They are mere engineering facts. How could that be the same thing as the existence of standards of right or wrong for your use of language? Just having that kind of structure and visual pathways in the brain wouldn't of itself mean that you had right and wrong here. So there's this kind of asymmetric dependence that does exist, that is, as, as someone said, diagnostic of um, what's going on when we have meaning of the distinction between illusions and mistakes, but uh, between illusions and getting it right. But merely finding a facsimile of that because of some engineering fact, that couldn't explain the existence of standards of rightness or wrongness. And it would be perfectly consistent with having a low temperature pathway and a high temperature pathway linked like that, that they're both getting it right or that they're both getting it wrong. Asymmetric dependence of itself can't explain the existence of standards of right or wrong. So if the facsimile is described in entirely naturalistic terms, then it can't explain the existence of standards of rightness or wrongness. It only looks like you're getting standards of rightness or wrongness here because the intuitive understanding of what's going on with this causal asymmetry presupposes talk about meaning. But when you really do the thing of abstracting from that and saying, let's suppose we've got just some basic engineering fact here, then the thing seems obviously completely hopeless. You couldn't explain right and wrong in those terms. But then once you get that point, it seems like that kind of point is going to apply to any attempt to explain the existence of standards of rightness and wrongness in purely physical terms. I mean, how could, how could, how could you possibly, I mean, if this engineering thing doesn't work, right? If you say, well, I mean, can you put your hand your hand? Is it, I, I don't. I hope this is, it seems perfectly obvious to me, but what seems perfectly obvious to me is not always perfectly obvious, if <laughs> you see what I mean. In fact, sometimes it's wrong. But can, can you just put your hand up if you agree with me that this high temperature, low temperature thing, that doesn't explain the existence of standards of right or wrong. Yeah? Is, is that? Yeah. Well, then wh what more could do it? I mean, suppose you said, ah, it's not temperature that's the important thing. It's electrical spiking activity. It's synchronization of neuron firing. What? <laughs> what do you want? I mean, what could possibly hit the spot there? Um, but if nothing there could possibly hit the spot, th th this kind of engineering thing isn't explaining the existence of standards of rightness or wrongness. Uh, we're not able in these terms to explain what we're trying to explain. Now that's, I mean, what's, one of the things that is so good about Fodor's um, discussion is that 
it lets you see just how stark the problem is. And he gets close enough to giving you an, an intuitive explanation of the, the phenomenon of right and wrong that you can see suddenly how very hard it's going to be to explain why um, uh, uh, there is such a phenomenon as reference. How it can be that there's such a phenomenon as reference or such a phenomenon as truth or falsity in a physical world. And in fact, once you grasp this point about the high temperature and the low temperature pathways, it seems like the thing is actually completely impossible. And the problem is quite general. Naturalism just can't happen. You can't give a naturalistic explanation of the existence of reference or standards of rightness and wrong. You can't explain how there's meaning in a natural world. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to have taken you this far. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> it's been fun, right? Right? <laughs> okay. I'm actually ending a little bit, uh, uh, significantly earlier than I intended to, but perhaps this is a melancholy enough note that... Um, <laughs> Well, I, I guess what we hope now is that Wittgenstein will um, show uh, the right way to think about standards of right and wrong. What's happening in Wittgenstein is that he is trying to characterize what it means to be going right or wrong in your use of a sign. He seems to want to, to explain what's going on here in a way that is not naturalistic, is not in terms of causal dependencies between pathways in the brain. Um, so it's a quite different take on the same problem, and that's what we'll do on the next couple of weeks. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>